Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. Illinois will soon become the first state in the nation to abolish cash bail. The Illinois Supreme Court just this week upheld the end of a money bond in a 5-2 to two court ruling released Tuesday. That 43-page decision found judges have tools other than money to guarantee a criminal defendant shows up for their day in court. Now, jails, courts, and prosecutors have 60 days to prepare to unwind that old system that has lasted nearly a century. Those preparations for the transition have been underway for a few years now, and the new law itself has also been written and rewritten several times to include updates along the way. Intense debate around this subject have, has divided public officials, police, and prosecutors alike. We have two guests on the record today to discuss the impact and implementation of this dramatic shift in the justice system in the land of Lincoln. Both of these guests with extensive backgrounds in law enforcement. State Senator Terry Bryant will join us in just a moment. But first, we sat down with former Illinois State Trooper Marie Franklin, who spent dozens of years, or a dozen years rather, working in law enforcement and came away with the view that a system designed to protect victims all too often creates them. A lower court initially ruled that the Safety Act was unconstitutional. What was your reaction when the Illinois State Supreme Court overruled that and allowed this policy to take effect? Oh, I was ecstatic. I have uh, worked in criminal justice. I am now an advocate to reform criminal justice. And uh, I was ecstatic that uh, we were finally looking at things in a different way. And, um, you know, in this country, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And having a cash bail system was not following that practice. The presumption of innocence or the benefit of the doubt is certainly a noble position. It says we're going to wait and let this be played out in the courts. But when a crime has occurred and a victim has been victimized, somebody is dangerous in that equation, whether they're still not yet proven to be innocent well, you know, or but guilty. But if you look at the statistics and the 250,000 people who are incarcerated pre-trial, most of their uh, the crimes are not what you would term violent. They're drug related, they're uh, mental issue related. And the only reason that they are incarcerated is because they don't have money to get out. So if you got a quote unquote dangerous person, if they've got enough cash, <laughs> you know, they're out. You're driving to the heart of this, which I think tries to draw a red line between violent crime and property crime or other nuisance crimes that aren't necessarily born of malintent. And, and that would say you, you can no longer buy your way out. Do you think that the Democrats who are advocating for this policy change lost control of the messaging somewhere? Because it really seemed like during the political season that a lot of the critics of this law were able to say it's going to be the biggest jailbreak ever. You know, I don't know, I don't think that we lost control and say we, you know, I'm you a Democrat, it, yeah. yeah, and I'm an advocate for this uh, law. I don't think we lost control of the messaging. I just think that there were people who took advantage of, of regular citizen not being up on what the law actually stated and using that to create fear to keep this system in place. Some people just don't like change. But you know, we require change here. The criminal justice system has, to some folks, and a particular group of folks, black and brown and poor people, done more harm than good. And we must do something to correct that. We cannot keep going in that system where we have people, you know, over 250,000 folks a year are incarcerated pre-trial in and Illinois? that means they in Illinois, yes, and that means that they haven't been convicted of anything. It's just an accusation. And how many of those are violent crimes? Do you know? You know, and I think percentage-wise, and don't quote me, I'm not quite sure about it. But I think you know, less than 20 percent are considered violent. You mm -hmm. know, murders and, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And you know, and I'm I'm being uh, generous there. I don't think it's that much. Mm -hmm. And so with, this, with the system that we are, that is coming, thank God, 
there is going to be a, a robust hearing to determine if this person is a danger to someone or is a flight risk. That was supposed to be the purpose of bail, you know, in the first place, to make sure this person shows up to court and make sure this person is not a danger to someone. But somehow it got turned into this, oh, this is how the county makes their money. And, and to get turned into this cash system, and it's just unfair, and it, you know, and it's, and then we just have to acknowledge that it was unfair, and it was unfair to black and brown and poor people, and we have to do something about that. And just for a bit of factual context or historical context, you said how it was first intended. Sometimes we see something in practice, and we we assume it's always been this way. Abraham Lincoln never knew what bail was. It exactly. wasn't around back then. It, in the nineteen early nineteen hundreds was when this became a practice in the first place. But I want to shift gears to your personal experience because in politics there's always a message, but messengers are interesting, right? You can speak from your vantage point different than maybe a politician would. You were an Illinois state trooper for more than a decade. I wonder how often you saw someone arrested, jailed, later proven not guilty in a court of law. You know, uh, there's a one particular incident that, that comes to mind. I uh, did a traffic stop on a person that was speeding and he had a warrant out in another county because he didn't return a blockbuster movie. And I had to arrest him. What My happened hands to were him? tied. He had his child in the car. He had to call someone to come get his kid or, you know, social services were going to have to step in. He didn't have the money to pay the bond, and so he had to sit in jail and wait for the county to come and pick him up. And what was your jurisdiction or territory? I, w I was here in, in this area in District 11 in, in, in uh, St. Clair County. So for, okay, St. Clair County. Mm -hmm. uh, and what have you heard about the current conditions of the St. Clair County Jail? Um, I'm, I'm sure that like most uh, jails are probably overcrowded. Um, I do know that uh, Sheriff Rick Watson uh, does try to do the best he can to treat people fairly. It's not about a particular jail, it's about the system. And it's about, you know, being able to implement this thing and implement this in, into the system to make the system fair. You know, right now the system is not fair. It's based on how much money you have. And, you know, we all know that that's just not fair to people. You mentioned earlier in this interview that some people just don't like change. And I think some people in our audience might be hesitant or reluctant to say, oh, this feels like a good idea, because it is different. Yes. And when you talk about crime and danger, uh, people tune in and they, they go, wait a minute, what does this mean for me? You alluded to this moral earlier in the story about the blockbuster DVD incident. Um, but I wonder, some folks may be arrested, jailed, and later proven guilty but perhaps not of a violent crime, maybe a property crime or a nuisance crime. Why should those folks, on a moral level, why should they get out of jail before their day in court? Well, because first of all, you know, we, we are a country that is based on your innocent until proven guilty. But there's been a preponderance of evidence. There's been a, a police officer has seen, okay, this looks like a crime has been committed here. Yes, but we still must, you know, you know, the, the, the uh, rule of thumb is, or, or my value is, it is, it is better to release one guilty person than to incarcerate 59 guilties. So you give people a chance to be out and be um, involved in their own defense. You know, if you're incarcerated pre-trial, you can't even participate in your own defense. You have to depend on someone else or your family is uh, devastated by trying to figure out, okay, do we pay rent or do we get out dad? Mm -hmm. So those things are just, you know, just not fair, you know, and in this system that has been proven to be devastating to black and brown communities, you know, one night of, of a 24 hour jail for someone can, you know, wreck their whole system, their, their car gets towed, their job gets lost, you know, their kids get taken away. And that's just not the way that we should, um, that is not a way to keep communities safe. Matter of fact, that is a way to, that devastates communities. So we need to make sure that what we are doing 
is what we say we're doing, that we are keeping communities safe and communities for everybody, not just for a select few. It sounds like you're speaking to the practical and economic realities of the disruption of being arrested and jailed yes. uh, even before that criminal conviction, should it come. Uh, my last question to you is this, because we do want to get to Senator Terry Bryant, but I, I wonder if one year from now, or one year after the 60 days from now when this is implemented, mm -hmm. if we look back and we see there's a significant drop off in the number of uh, uh, suspects and defendants who were supposed to appear in court but didn't. If we see, because sufficient surety is the word the Constitution uses. Yes. It says we need to have a surety, we need to have a guarantee that this defendant is going to come and actually show up in court. But without that bond there, if we see a significant decline in people actually making their court date, will that be time to say maybe some of this was a mistake? No, and because, you know, studies have shown Cook County is already doing this. And they have already shown that if you want people to show up in court, bond is not the way to do it. A simple text message, <laughs> you know, gets people, you know, just a simple reminder gets people in court. But that's, know, a, that's a scary moment. Some people might be saying, I'm going to court and I'm about to lose my liberty for a while, right? I, I, if they're convicted. Yes. There's, there's motive not to show up. But there's also motive to show up and, and, and for some people it's just to get the thing done. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, because if you don't show up and there are ways to, you know, if people don't show up for court, you know, there are consequences for that. You know, they get a warrant, you know, they're, you know, uh, but you don't want to put the, a heavy burden on somebody who doesn't show up for traffic court and they got a warrant with money they can't pay. So let me ask the question in a different way. How will you know a year from now that this program is working? So a part of the Safety Act and part of the Pretrial Fairness Act uh, says that the uh, counties and the state must um, uh, take data, you know, record data of measure what's it. happening with people and measure what's going on. So we should be able from that data, because I don't think prior to this, they were, uh, they were told they had to do it. I think with this, uh, with the Safety Act and the Pretrial Fairness Act, they are obligated to collect data. And so that way, you know, in a year from now, you can look at the data and see. But with, you know, the federal system doesn't use uh, cash bond. The juvenile system doesn't use cash bond. And Cook County has been doing this for uh, over a year now. Prior to it being um, implemented, you know, they've, they've already said, we're going to just get a head start on this and do it now. And, you know, numbers have shown that a simple text message, people show up. Mm. Well, Marie Franklin, a fascinating conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Senator Bryant worked at the Illinois Department of Corrections for two decades in two different state prisons, starting that career uh, back in 1994. Thanks for mm -hmm. joining us. Thank you. Uh, let's start with the, the moral aim of the justice system. Do you believe that all Americans are innocent until proven guilty? I do. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, it, I think some questions maybe as we talk are going to come up about whether should, someone should be locked up uh, when they haven't been proven guilty yet. Uh, and uh, I, I think there needs to be a full review about whether someone should be locked up when they're innocent, you know, they're innocent before proven guilty. But um, I think we're, as we talk about the Safety Act, one of the things that we need to be looking at is did we need to reform our uh, bail system? or did we throw, need to throw it completely out, which is what the Safety Act does? It, it throws it out, but it replaces it with something, too. We'll, we'll get into some of those details. Mm -hmm. uh, another moral question about the criminal justice system. Do you see evidence uh, in your years looking at the justice system that poverty played a role in crime? Well, uh, uh, of course. That's, you know, that's kind of, that kind of goes without saying. If you are in a more affluent area, you're going to have more opportunities available to you. If you are living in a more economically, economically depressed area, then of course you might do some things that you wouldn't if more resources were available to you. So, so those reforms that you just said should mm -hmm. happen, should they take that poverty or wealth factor into account? Perhaps. Uh, I think uh, in regard to the Safety Act and this, one of the tools that we have at our disposal in the system that we have, even if we reform it, is a judicial discretion. So, uh, in fact, you know, a judge can look 
at a person's ability to bond out or the ability to look at what has that person's life been like as a whole? Did they have the opportunities? If given uh, certain, you know, maybe they have some counseling done or they have some things available to them now, would, would they be a risk to society? Unfortunately, I think with the Safety Act, we've taken out a lot of the measures of judicial discretion that were there, and we've completely taken that uh, aspect away from a judge. Well, a, a judge will still have discretion to uh, keep someone in jail and refuse or deny their chance to buy their way out if they're accused of violent crimes, of hurting someone. Do you yeah. see benefit to that aspect of this? Well, I do if, if you take it by the strictest sense of that particular crime. But a judge, when the judge is able to look at something as a whole, you could have a circumstance where uh, maybe all someone did was trespass around someone's property, let's say. But if that person happens to be an individual uh, who has been uh, uh, someone who, via, you know, who was a domestic abuser, and this is their, their next means to put some uh, fear into the person that, you know, that they're trying to abuse, uh, maybe if you're looking at it and say, well, you know, this trespass is not that big a deal, but if you look at it as the whole, then yeah, that's, it's progressive. So the next step for this person would be this. So a judge would have the opportunity to look at that and say, I'm going to keep this person locked up because their past behavior has indicated to me that the next thing they're going to do is something more violent. And a couple uh, points of fact, a lot, you, you raised a couple of scenarios there. Uh, Matters of trespassing, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court said a police officer can not only cite that person, but physically remove them mm -hmm. from the location. And aggravated stalking uh, is one of those reasons uh, for a domestic violence suspect mm -hmm. or defendant mm -hmm. or, or someone who has priors. Uh, the courts can also take that into consideration. In fact, that's why domestic violence mm -hmm. advocacy groups supported these changes, because those people would be not able to bond out and go right back to that situation. Yeah. They'd be held. Uh, so you, you mentioned like in the lead up to this, mm -hmm. you used the word that update, I mm -hmm. think in regard to the Safety Act, that there have been, we call them trailer bills, right? right? Some trailer bills. It's kind of like insider uh, to come behind. Yeah. And I would say to your question and to the update, uh, in regard to update, this is probably going to be something that's going to be updated over and over again. But those updates are things that were brought up in debate on the House and the Senate floor when the original Safety Act was brought up. Had the the uh, um, the formers of this bill, had the people who put this bill together, listened to law enforcement, listened to ju state's attorneys, and not just the one or two that they cherry picked, had they listened to them and really put some meat into this act, we wouldn't need all of these trailer bills. I think your um, the prior speaker uh, talked about data and looking at data a year from now. Well, that data that we're going to be looking at is whether or not someone reoffended. I would hate to be the person who was the victim of a violent crime because someone was allowed to be out and I'm now, now I'm a source of data instead of having that person locked up and, you know, uh, and, and not able to get to me. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the trailer bills or the updates, the revisions mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. law. Uh, the version of the bill that exists in law now, mm -hmm. better or worse than the initial version? Oh, it's better than the initial version, uh, but there are... Because... Uh, well, I mean, so because we made some changes to or clarified or made changes to trespass. Um, we made a change. One of the things, you know, you mentioned that I worked at two institutions. There were two others that were kind of satellites. My early career, I was at work release where you also had electronic detention monitoring. The original bill said that a person could be gone for 48 hours and, you know, basically nothing was going to happen to them, right? They'd and, be off the radar. So right, they'd be totally off the radar. I think we added some language that said uh, that they, they could, it, it, you only would charge them with an escape if the person's intention was to escape, right? But in my experience in corrections, I could see a guy falling down on the ground when the police show up and said, well, you know, I got a little drunk, and so I know I'm in Missouri, but I was drunk or I was high, or whatever the circumstance happens to be, they're not going to say that they tried to escape. So we made some improvements on in regard to electronic monitoring and so forth. So there were some improvements, but there's a whole lot of more improvements. And, you know, Mark, I'm sure you're probably going to ask some questions about this, but I think my biggest concern right now, because my district is a southern Illinois district where it's not, it's not a wealthy district from, you know, from Missouri to Indiana. So I cover the span of the entire state. 
And I just left a town hall a little bit earlier this morning where we talked about Randolph County, which is, you know, a portion of that is part of the metro, kind of the metro east. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking at fines and fees that they will no longer be able to collect because those are also gone it, with the Safety Act, about 90% of that uh, to the tune of about $320,000. For a non-affluent county, $320,000 is a lot of money. That's money that won't go to counseling, won't go to domestic violence programs, and it has to be recouped. So what happens? Property taxes have to be increased. Mm -hmm. On the Illinois side, that's a big deal for property taxes to be increased. I think advocates have long said that the, that operation of government, mm -hmm. those programs that you just said, shouldn't be underwritten by the backs of people who are innocent yet not proven guilty. And I totally get that. And, and so the, all along, the legislature has said, we'll make up those fees. And they right? haven't and done it They haven't done it. So is that an, are, you, are you outlining an update to come? I, a I'm, I'm saying you can't, have, you can't have one. So Illinois is remarkably good at doing everything backwards, right? So you create a mandate of some sort and then figure out how you're going to fund it. It would be much better if we said, oh, we've created the funding for Ready this and now aim. we're going to make this. Yeah, it's being reactive to everything instead of being out in front of it. I want to ask you some of the same benchmark questions so we can put down some, some goals mm -hmm. and say year, a year from now, two years from now. Uh, do you expect, you anticipate more people will miss their court dates without that bond? I do, and especially along the border counties. So uh, again, remember, I have Missouri and Indiana in my district. Uh, there was an article a while back, I think it was from New Jersey, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. about an officer who arrested a guy at the beginning of his 12-hour shift and arrested the same guy seven times mm -hmm. during that day. When you're in a border county... You'll have those problem suspects from time to time. Sure. sure. So, yeah, so that might be an outlier, mm -hmm. maybe. But in the, in the Metro East uh, and going south from there, if someone steals a car and they get arrested and they bond out that day... They're going to cross the river and go into Missouri. Now you're going to prep, maybe you're going to get that person back, mm -hmm. but now you have to go through all of the process of bringing them back over from Missouri into Illinois or Indiana into Illinois. I want to get your response to one other quick question from some of the House Republicans that are uh, in and around your part of Southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. they, they argue that the Constitution, the state Constitution, says, "quote All persons shall be bailable mm -hmm. by sufficient sureties." And they said that word "shall" doesn't have any wiggle room in it. Certainly, mm -hmm. it doesn't. Mm -hmm. But judges today can already say a sufficient surety is zero dollars and you're going to face a consequence if you miss your court date. That's yeah, a sufficient surety, right? Yeah, on your own cognizance. Right? So can't it be also true that bonds set at zero dollars plus these other consequences are a sufficient surety? If you allowed the judge to continue to have discretion, but much of the Safety Act takes that discretion away from the judges. Mm -hmm. So where the judge could look at it and say, you're a pretty good guy, I think you're going to make it back, you've got a lot of family, you've got ties here to the community, a lot of those resources and that discretion is taken away from them. We look forward to continuing this conversation mm -hmm. for the uh, two months to come until it takes place. Thanks for joining us. Before we go, i got to rope you into a political question All here. Right. Darren Bailey or Mike Bost? Uh, I'm going to hold off for just a little while in uh, endorsing What anyone. are you looking for in a candidate? So I'm looking for... I, I never uh, endorse uh, uh, someone running against an incumbent that's doing their job. Is Mike Boss doing his job? Mike Boss does his job. There you go. Might you endorse Mike Boss? I did not. But you might. I might. Very interesting. Yeah. State Senator Terry Bryant, thank you for joining us. To you joining us from home or wherever you're at, we hope you have a great week. We'll see you at this same time next week. Until then, we're off the record.